Let's talk about modeling real life with differential equations. This is, to be honest, why I love differential equations. It's where real life and math meet. When we're trying to model real life situations, we have to do a few things. Believe it or not, one of the most difficult things is to identify our variables. That is, we have to figure out what is affecting our situation. For instance, if we were looking at, say, oyster beds that they're trying to build in Maryland to rebuild the oyster population, when they were first running some experiments, they were finding that although they had modeled mathematically that oysters should be producing more, they weren't. And it turned out it's because they didn't take into account the height of the oyster bed, that the silt from the runoff from the land was covering up the oysters. So they didn't realize one of the variables they had to identify and track was how high they put the oyster beds. So sometimes trying to figure out what is affecting your situation is one of the most difficult parts of going from real life to math. Once you've identified your variables, the next thing you do is make a hypothesis. Once you make a hypothesis, you collect some data and you evaluate your model. This causes you either to go back and re-identify variables or alter your hypothesis. The better your model becomes, the more it accurately describes what will happen in real life. What differential equations focuses the most on is rate of change. Well, we've already talked about rate of change when we were doing our M&M modeling. Let's talk about population dynamics. This is when a population changes based on the current population. In this case, p is our population and our independent variable is time. So your rate of change of population depends on what your population is at that particular moment. For instance, if you had a petri dish of bacteria, the rate of change of bacteria will depend on how many bacteria are in the petri dish. That funny looking alpha symbol stands for proportional. That is, the rate of change of the population versus time is proportional to p. A way of writing that with an equal sign is to put in a constant k. If k is positive, then this is growth. There are some equations I'm going to ask you to memorize, and then there's some that I won't. And I'll always mark the ones that I'm expecting you to memorize with something like no for exam. This population dynamic is very important and will run across quite a bit. So this is one I'm asking you to know. This population differential equation works when the population is small and we're looking at a short period of time. Because just looking at this equation, it doesn't look like there'd be any limit to it. So say I had, I don't know, a bunch of bunnies in a yard. The bunnies would reproduce, creating more and more bunnies. But there really is a limit to how many bunnies I could end up with because there'd be a limit of food and there'd be a limit of space. A more realistic model is using what's called the logistics equation. The equation is very similar to the population dynamics equation that I just came up with. But now I'm multiplying it by this 1 minus p over k factor. Our r is the, our little k from the previous example, where it's the population rate. But this k is the carrying capacity. And if you look at this, once the population, p, equals the carrying capacity, k, then that second term in the parentheses becomes 1. And 1 minus 1 is 0. So at that point, the rate of change of population is 0. That is, you'd have no additional bunnies once you hit the carrying capacity of the field. This is another formula I want you to know for the exam. The next equation that I want you to know is radioactive decay. That is, the change of population over time is equal to k times p, which looks exactly like our population dynamics. Well, it turns out the only thing that's different between this equation and the previous differential equation we had is in this case, k is going to be negative, in which case that's a decreasing population. This is like our M&M case where people were taking M&Ms every hour. And again, I would like you to know that for the exam. Another physical phenomena that can be modeled with differential equations is Newton's law of cooling. This gets a little confusing because we've got big T's and little T's. But I'm going to say the big T is temperature and the little T is time. K is again 
a proportional constant. And what this is, is indicative of the median that the item is cooling in. For instance, if you had a cake and took it out of the oven, this K would be dependent on how fast cooling occurs in air. Whereas if you had a hot pan, for instance, and put it in water, the K would be different because then it would be the rate of cooling with water as the median. What this TM stands for is the temperature of the medium. So the difference between the temperature of the item and the temperature of the median determines how fast something's going to cool. And this makes sense. If you take an ice cube out of a freezer and then put it in the oven, it's going to melt faster than if you took that same ice cube and put it on the counter at room temperature. And this is another one that I'd like you to know for the exam. Notice I haven't talked about solving these at all because I haven't given you any skills yet in how to solve differential equations, but introducing the concept of this now I think makes it easier when we start learning the tools and then we can start learning how to solve some of these. We can also use differential equations to talk about the spread of disease. You could have x of t being the people with the disease and y of t with people not yet exposed to the disease. In this model, we're not going to consider people having an immunity to a particular disease. Obviously, that's not re very realistic, but when we're first starting to do models, we try to keep things simple. If we wanted to look at the rate of change of the people with the disease, what that is is equal to k times x times y. That is the interaction between the people with the disease and the people not exposed is what causes that rate of change of people with the disease. So the fewer people that are not exposed, then the rate of change will also get smaller. This is not one that I need you to memorize for the exam. This is another one I'm not going to ask you to memorize, but I wanted to include it, well, mainly because I'm an electrical engineer. Electrical engineering uses a lot of differential equations. This is called an LCR circuit. There's an inductor, a resistor, and a capacitor. And the differential equation that is modeled by this is given right here. The Q is the charge. And this is a good opportunity, even though, again, I'm not going to ask you to memorize this for the exam. Let's not forget about what we talked about before. This is going to be a second order, ordinary differential equation, and this looks to me to be linear. This is also autonomous. And again, this is autonomous because there's no independent variable in the equation. There's no t in there. Let's go back and look at some of these others that we talked about. This one is first order. And I'm not going to really talk about linear or nonlinear in this case because this is a case we haven't really talked about where we have two dependent variables. But this is certainly an ODE. It's an ordinary differential equation. And this is autonomous. Because again, there's no T in my equation. This also looks like a first order. This one looks linear. It's an ODE. And again, it's autonomous. For radioactive decay, first order, linear, ODE, and autonomous. And the same with the population dynamics. But the logistics equation, if I went ahead and multiplied that out, I would find that although this one is in fact first order, this is nonlinear. Because if I multiplied this out, I'd have an R times a p times p over k, so I'd end up with a p squared. I, had, I would have my dependent variable squared. So that's going to be nonlinear. But again, this is an ODE, and this is also autonomous. And it seems like a lot of these problems, in fact, I believe all of them are in fact autonomous, which actually makes sense. Autonomous means that the independent variable is not a part of my differential equation. So say you were doing a physics experiment let's talk about a falling body problem. So I have a mass that's dropping, and what's pulling it down is the force due to gravity. And in the opposite direction, 
is the force due to air resistance. I know that F is equal to MA. Well, if I have some physics, I do know that F is equal to MA. This is not a physics class, so I won't be asking you to memorize physics equations. I know that the force due to gravity is equal to M times G, where G depends on the gravitational pull of the planet you're on. And I also know that acceleration is nothing more than the first derivative of velocity with respect to time. This is my total force. My force due to gravity is mg. And finally, I have to look at my force due to the air resistance. And that's equal to negative k times my velocity. And it's negative because it's going in the opposite direction of the gravity. So if I put these together, I can say f equals fg plus fa or m dv dt equals mg minus kv. If I want to put this in standard form, if I wanted to make this a little cleaner, I could divide both sides by m, and this would be my differential equation. Again, this is not one I'm going to ask you to memorize because I'm not going to assume that you had physics. But if you look at this equation, you see our dependent variable is velocity, and our independent variable is time. This is a first order linear ODE, which is also autonomous. And why this should make sense is if you were doing this physics experiment, and you were dropping a mass, and you were trying to look at the velocity of the object, if this was not autonomous, that is, if the current time was a part of this differential equation, that would mean that the 9 o'clock physics class would get a different answer than the 1 o'clock physics class. Since it shouldn't matter when you run this experiment, it makes sense that this would have to be an autonomous equation. That is, the independent variable time does not factor into our differential equation. One more example, and this is one that I do want you to memorize. These are mixture problems. These problems are always going to be set up the same way. We're going to have a well-mixed tank, and we're going to have some liquid going in at a certain rate, and some liquid going out at a certain rate. And we'll also know how big the tank is. And generally, we're talking about things like salt. There's some salt in the tank. And we want to know what the rate of change of salt is over time. Now, this might not seem like a realistic problem, but instead of thinking of this as a tank, say you thought of this as a lake with a stream in and a stream out and say there were some pollutants going into the stream that was feeding into the lake and you wanted to look at what happened to the the quality of the water in the lake and if you stopped having pollutants being entered into the lake how long would it take for the lake to lose all the pollutants so i'm going to say for this example we're going to have a rate of water going in at three gallons per minute. And I'm going to be nice and have the rate out be the same. What's going into the tank is going to have two pounds of salt per gallon. And I don't know the concentration of salt coming out of the tank because that depends on how much water is in the tank and how much salt was in the tank in the beginning. I'm going to say the tank is 300 gallons. And what I'm going to focus on is A of T. That is, the number of pounds of salt in the tank. So let's look at this. What I can say is the rate of change of salt, that is dA dt, is equal to the rate of salt coming in minus the rate of the salt going out. So let's look at these independently. The rate of the salt going in, in this case, is known. It's simply the amount of salt times the rate of the liquid, in which case I know I have two pounds of salt per gallon times three gallons per one minute. So my rate of salt in is six pounds per minute. What about my rate out? The trouble is I don't know the amount of salt that's coming out. So I'm just going to say that the concentration of the salt coming out is whatever's in the tank at that particular moment in time divided by how big the tank is, which is 300 gallons, times the rate of the fluid coming out, which is simply 3 gallons per minute. 
Let me be careful with my units here. So again, this is the, just like for the Rn, it's the amount of salt times the rate of the liquid. So in this case, this is equal to 1 over 100 At. So I could rewrite this as dA dt equals 6 minus 1 over 100 At. And if I wanted to put this in standard form and use prime notation, this would be my differential equation. Again, this is a first order, it's autonomous, it's linear, and I still don't know how to solve them, but I will before this week is out.